Greetings, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you joining us from the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast. Good evening to those who might be coming from elsewhere. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the Director of the Youth Ministry Institute at Yale Divinity School. And the YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled Innovation, Imagination, and Frustration, New Directions for Youth Ministry with the Reverend Matthew Overton. I see some familiar faces and names in our group, so welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. And a special welcome to all of you who are joining our community for the first time. We're really glad to have you with us. For our, for our time today, Reverend Overton will speak to us and then there will be some final time for questions and you will remain muted throughout the sessions, but please do put questions in the chat window and Matt will address them as we go also. So if you have a question that pops up while he is presenting, please do feel free to type it in there at any time. Our office has a great staff and I just wanna send a quick shout out to Megan Lukens, our communications coordinator and to thank Megan for her work in putting this together. We work as a great team in our office and I'm so grateful for that. If you're new to the Youth Ministry Institute, we highly encourage you and invite you to peruse our website when you get a free chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth. We have training modules for your youth leaders, discussion forums so you can talk to other youth workers when you get a free moment to bat around some tough ideas. We have over a thousand video clips and lectures given by world's leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID-19 era resources. We have tips for resilience with youth. We have resources for anti-racism work, links to other articles and materials. And all of that is available for free. So please do feel free to check out our website. We also want you to mark your calendars for our upcoming events. Our theme for this year is Not Your Mother's Youth Group, Ministry to Youth in 2021. And with this in mind, our next offering will be on Wednesday, April 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, at which time we will invite the Reverend Kiwa Longani. Reverend Longani will speak about engaging with LGBTQ plus youth and providing a welcoming space for youth who are questioning their sexuality gender identity, and gender expression. So please do consider joining us then on Wednesday, April 7th. A link to that registration can be found on our website and in our email newsletter, and it will go in our chat window as well. And now for the reason you all are here today, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you and to introduce you all to Reverend Overton. The Reverend Matthew Overton is a PCUSA minister in the Pacific Northwest. He has over 20 years of experience working in the field of youth ministry. His experience as a minister led him to begin to envision a new path for working with young people. What if youth ministry could be entrepreneurial? And what would that look like? And out of those seeds, the Columbia Future Forge was created, of which Overton is the executive director. The Forge is a nonprofit church ministry providing teens and young adults with job skills, life skills, youth ministry mentorship, and a fair wage for their services. His book, Mentorship and Marketplace, A New Direction for Youth Ministry, tells the story of Overton's social enterprise endeavors with young people and invites its readers to imagine a new landscape in the youth ministry field. Reverend Overton, thank you so much for being here. We are beyond honored to have you and I'll let you take it away. Great. Well, it's nice to see uh, all of you, or at least some of you on the bar at the top. Um, it's a real privilege to get to be here. I um, <clears throat> I love to share about the work that we, um, that I like to say we kind of staggered into on accident. Um, and I do say we, um, because as much as I'll talk about the process for me in doing this work, it ceased to be my idea the moment I got six or seven other people into a room and we all thought and prayed about it and figured out whether this was a good crazy idea or a bad crazy idea. And so it's really ceased to be my vision long ago. And I think it's really Holy Spirit led work and I'm very thankful for that. And so I, I would describe the last five years as some of the most joyous of my ministry career. And so it excites me to get to share about this every time I get to and 
Um, and so thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here and do that because this this work and doing this work this way, it's not perfect. It's not a silver bullet, but it brings me joy every time I get to do it. So I'm, I'm just very happy to share with you. So I'm going to um, jump to a screen share here and uh, <clears throat> here we go and I will dive right in. Um, OK, so um, the Columbia Future Forge, this is the nonprofit that I run and um, we're going to hear all about it today. So I like to know whenever I'm going into a presentation where are we headed <laughs> a little bit up front. So this will give you a sense of where we're going to go um, today. Number one, we're going to look at the problems and holes in youth ministry that I perceived and saw as a youth worker that when I started this had been doing youth work for about 15 years. Um, and because that helped germinate some of the idea um, for this. And I'm only going to name some of those. Um, there's probably a whole bunch we could name, but I'm going to name a few. Um, two, we're going to look at the story of uh, kind of this innovative experiment that we launched on. I, I think it ceased to be an experiment it is more of a conceptual idea at this point. Um, and it's now called the Columbia Future Forge. You're going to hear the story of how that came to be. Um, I'm going to try and share a little bit about kind of the values and theology, and those are intertwined. Our values really come from our theology that undergirds all the work that we do and the way that we go about it, um, and try to share even some of the theological process that we've tried to now build into the way that we work with students and adults that, that work within our ministry. And at the end, I thought, you know, we'll take some, some questions. I'll back out of the screen share, and then maybe share a little bit of wisdom because some people are often wondering how do they do this in their own context or how would they come up with an innovative or entrepreneurial idea and um you know as much as i've learned about how to do it i've also learned a lot about how not to do it and um i'm happy to share what wisdom i can uh if that's helpful um for folks but but uh we'll really use that as a q a time um and uh, uh anyway um so my number one rule when I present is please interrupt, um, fire those questions into the chat because um, I tend to share best when it's off the cuff in a lot of ways. I like telling the story rather than um, thinking of this as a program or a schema that somehow you have to adhere to. Um, write questions down along the way if that's helpful to save until the end if you'd rather do it that way. And what this thing is about is not to give a recipe. It's not about um, information in a lot of ways. It's really about cultivating imagination. Um, that I think what we're talking about is figuring out how would we imagine different ways to uh, communicate and embody the love of God in the lives of students and young adults. And, um, and so I hope that if nothing else, when you come out of this, that you have a sense of stimulated imagination about what's possible or what's conceivable um, to do ministry in a different way um, with youth. Uh, in your context. And I hope that I get across my joy in doing work this way and tell enough stories to give you a, a picture of what's brought that joy. Uh, I am going to try to to litter this with stories along the way. Um, you know, be thinking about as you go through this, what connects with you or something that you're already doing. I think most innovation is really about riffs on things that already exist. Um, and most entrepreneurial youth ministry, I think, you know, has the opportunity to come from um, things that you're already interested in. That's the number one question I ask when people call me and they're like, I, you know, I want to do something entrepreneurial or can I start my own landscaping company? <laughs> you know, which is, you'll hear about in a little bit, but, and, and usually my first question is, well, what do you love? Like, what do you really enjoy doing? And, and chances are that any great entrepreneurial idea or small one that you might have to do youth ministry differently is going to come from that place, how God has wired you, what God has cultivated in you. And so you have to pay attention to that. And the last question, and this is a big part of my theology, is what is it that is worth risking for? Um, in the Christian story, I think we uh, serve a God who very clearly knows who his beloved is. And because he knows who his beloved is, is absolutely willing to risk everything for the sake of that. And I do think a part of entrepreneurial work, whether you're talking about the marketplace or ecclesially in the church, is um, what is it that we would be so compelled to do that we would be willing to risk our blood, sweat, and tears to do it, um, to take those kinds of risks? And I think the gospel involves risk um, to our previous ways of thinking and being. And so I just encourage you to ponder that maybe in the, in the next few days after this. What would you risk for? Um, or, or how would you risk in a way that would be compelling when it comes to students and youth ministry? So that's kind of what we're going to do together today. Uh, and I and I hope we're able to kind of accomplish at least some of those things. Um, so let, let me tell you a little bit about kind of my story. 
I was born in Virginia. I grew up in Southern California. Um, right near the coast, you'll be subjected to pr multiple nautical images because I like the ocean. And so the, like my, in the early stage of this, I had a lot of nautical imagery that works for me. And so you'll see some of that. But I, I grew up in Virginia, Southern California. I graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary, um, oh gosh, a number of years ago. And I have worked with a variety of churches and denominations and done ministry in a variety of places uh, in, my, uh, in my career. Um, New Jersey, California. I did a little bit of youth ministry in Scotland uh, for a time. Um, Northern California and Southern California, two completely different worlds. And now the Pacific Northwest. And I've been here for about 11 years. And overall, I've been doing youth ministry for 21 years. I actually started when I was 19 years old um, doing youth ministry. I, I Somebody was um, silly enough to give me a, um, a role as a youth director when I was in college. And so um, that's where I kind of began. Um, I'm still in youth ministry um, in kind of a different capacity than I was even a year and a half or two years ago, just because the growth of what we're doing now has required me to, to step into kind of a different role, but I am still on the ground with students. Um, I write a little bit here and there. I, I blog, and then I wrote a small book on kind of uh, social enterprise, redemptive enterprise and youth ministry, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of an emerging terminology and a little bit about why I'm innovation. So I do some of that. I definitely have a social enterprise bent. So I'm very interested in innovation and entrepreneurship is a big word. It can be defined in a lot of different ways. Um, but I have a particular bent for social enterprise. So, and I work with sometimes with churches on their own ideas and I have a pretty heavy um, social enterprise bent. So uh, let's keep going. So part of my story begins with a simple fact that after 15 years of doing youth ministry, you know, I got pretty dissatisfied with just some holes that I saw in youth ministry. I had some, uh, and I'll talk about those in a second. I had some real concerns about the sustainability of churches and uh, youth ministry in general. And I know sustainability is a weird term, um, more in terms of the economic sustainability. Like, you know, we had this certain engine for the last 1700 years of people giving to churches and institutions in a certain way and that allowed us to do ministry in a certain way and all of that is shifting and so I wondered man I really love telling kids about Jesus like how would I continue to I really love engaging God's sense of kingdom work and justice with students in my community how how would I do that if I couldn't do it um fund it the way that I had if that's going away what would I do and so there were concerns about sustainability that came up um, I had concerns about emerging student gaps. Um, you know, I kept seeing in my students, um, you know, we've probably, if you've got any reading in youth ministry, you probably know kind of this sense of like the idea of extended adolescence. Like when is it that, you know, teenagers become adults and, and has that picture sort of lengthened? And I, you know, I kept running into students that seemed to have these places in their life where they were scared and worried about entering into adulthood. Um, they you know, some of them for very legitimate reasons. Um, some of them really struggled to do problem solving, like autonomously. Like I noticed these things and they were things that, you know, I didn't necessarily struggle with and I didn't know why that was, but I got concerned about those. And uh, I saw high levels of like anxiety as kids got ready to transition out of their parents' home, whether it was college or a trade school or just the local junior college or just getting a job. They just felt overwhelmed. And I was like, why don't our ministries get them ready for that? And I also, you know, when I got out of seminary, it was right at the start of kind of the missional church movement. And I was really steeped in that theology at my particular seminary. And so I was constantly trying to figure out what does it mean as a minister that I'm also called out into the community beyond the walls of my church? What would it look like for me to embody the sentness of Christ, the way that Christ is sent into the world? How would I do that? And I tried several things, but they, none of them felt like they really captured uh, the way that I saw Jesus kind of entering into people's lives and entering into the world and things like that. And so I was just constantly fishing around for, gosh, Lord, what does it mean for me to be sent out into my community um, and to love my neighbor in that way? And so these are some of kind of the, the birthplaces of my, uh, my story. Um, so this is kind of where the idea of the forge kind of begins. So some of the problems that I saw in youth ministry, um, I'm going to use, a, again, here's, here's those terrible nautical images that I started with. But some of what I saw in youth ministry was that um, 
our youth ministry model essentially felt like a ship in a bottle to me, whether you're talking about it like spiritually for teenagers and young adults or practically, it felt like youth ministry was this very safe environment with this really high modicum of niceness attached to it. And it just felt like we we created a great safe environment for kids, but that wasn't necessarily getting them ready for what life is about. And I think part of what makes life inherently interesting is um, is that it's real. Um, you get to do real things and try real things on for size. And I constantly felt like our students, whether it was a part of youth ministry or uh, the programs that they participated in a community, really existed in this sort of ship in a bottle environment. And I, and I, what bothered me about that is faith itself is meant to be lived out on the ground. And our youth ministry models often had this contained environment where I don't think you can really understand what Jesus is talking about and what kingdom ethics are really about until you're actually out in the world trying them on for size. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure that youth ministry does that well all the time. And we need to figure out how to build a platform of youth ministry that feels like kids can sail with their faith on the open sea a bit, if we could use that image. I also felt like there's this weird dynamic in youth ministry. Um, and if you hate sharks, I'm sorry for this image because it is kind of terrifying. Um, where, you know, the world has changed a little bit, I think, in the minds of parents and teenagers. And, it, it, you know, the world in some ways has been an inherently scary place for a great portion of the world every day. But I think for a lot of the students that I worked with, all of a sudden, the price tag on life felt really high. Where they were talking about debt or just being able to make ends meet once they they got out of the house, um, their worries about the future and their sense, you know, this is particularly, I think, the wake of the economic downturn that we hit in the Great Recession. They all of a sudden had a, a different bent, like it um, about, you know, like, can we really afford to show up on a weekly basis and play games and go to camp? And I think there was less of a sense of that. And so I, I had a sense that, you know, we're sending kids out into a very real world that's beautiful and wonderful and God is there. And yet we all know that the world is a very real place that can be scary at times. And I kept asking myself the question, does our ministry model, like, does it really actually prepare them for any of that? Um, and even enacting the gospel is a risky proposition if we take Jesus seriously. And so have we actually prepared them for that kind of work? Um, uh, another kind of thing is, you know, I kept seeing what I would call a two rank system emerge in my youth group, in my communities, which is I would see a lot of um, kind of haves and have nots in my youth ministry. I remember vividly driving in a 15 passenger van. Uh, I was driving the van and I had, you know, the multiple bench seats behind me. And, you know, on one bench seat, I've got these four, four kids who, you know, I know are kind of living hand to mouth. You know, one of them doesn't have any running water where they live. And on the next bench seat behind them, I've got four other students uh, just wringing their hands about their class ranking and grades and what college they're going to get into. And I just thought, man, how do you hold these kind of, how does youth group hold these kinds of very different students together in one place? And I wasn't sure that it did. And I was like, man, what, what would it look like to build a model where, you know, these students could feel like community but the, that sort of two rank system of our economy is sort of muted. Could I create a, a more equal grounding for them um, as we went about it? And so there's this sort of emerging two class society maybe started to bother me a little bit. And last, um, this is a terribly titled slide, but I, I kind of wrestled with two other dynamics about youth ministry. One was, you know, I noticed that we were about to send kids, you know, after like four or seven years, depending on how long a kid was involved in my church, I felt like we were just forcing them to walk the plank and then throwing them out into the open ocean. And I was struck by the fact that so many other environments in the adult world require a certain level of like high accountability and even directness, like when you're in an, in an employment setting. And yet I often found that I was not nearly as direct with my students at church about things that they sometimes needed to work on as a, a personal matter or things. And I, because the church calls me to be kind, because God calls me to be nice, sometimes I felt like I was actually stunting the growth of my students, practically and spiritually speaking. And that bothered me a little bit. And I, and I started to wonder why, 
why can't we actually get them more ready for life by being a little bit more direct and having harder conversations? Why does youth ministry struggle to do that at times? And then I also wondered um, a bit for my adults, you know, I have all these adults in my church that have all these incredible gifts and I don't feel like we're really tapping into them. What if we could kind of leverage some of their gifts to make kingdom impact and set things right kind of in our communities? What would it look like to, to do that work? Um, and you'll hear more about how this model gets at that. And so these things were the kind of things that were just, just bouncing around in my head and in my heart for, well, probably not all 15 years, but certainly the last five before I began this sort of work. And I began to conceive of, I would listen to youth pastors talk about and gripe about the lack of commitment on the part of families, um, the lack of commitment sometimes on the part of students. And I started thinking to myself, you know, I don't think that's actually a problem with our families and students. I think it's actually a problem with the models we've created. And instead of exercising judgment on our students and families for not showing up the way that they once did or not thinking that what we're doing is relevant to the world that their kids live in, what if we actually listen to that, those wins, and, the, and listen to the headwinds that are against them as families or parents or students, and then built models that harness the wind. And I staggered across this article about a conceptual design for a Scandinavian cargo ship called the Vinskip. And it became a really good image for how I think about all this. And the Vinskip essentially is a cargo ship um, that whose hull functions as a kind of a sail on the bottom. And they estimate that if they can get it from, from concept to uh, prototype, that it can save about 60% of fossil fuels and shipping going across the ocean because it will harness the wind and it tacks with the wind. It doesn't work against it all the time. And I felt like a lot of youth ministry was insisting that it knew how to do things the right way. And if you know families would just wake up and figure it out, they'd come back to our churches or our ministries. And I just thought that is just a, such a terrible non-Christ-like way to think about this. We rather, we, we would be better off listening to our people and saying, okay, God, how do I, am I called to serve these people in a different way? Because something has changed. There's something different. And so I've tried to build a model that essentially works with the winds that are going on around us uh, to do things differently. So let me tell you a little bit about kind of uh, how this started. So um, part of this started for, for me uh, in Northern California uh, about seven years ago, well, longer than that, I suppose. Um, when, when I took my first call out of a church, we, we, uh, we bought a house in Northern California in an area that ended up being the hardest hit, one of the hardest hit areas uh, in the housing downturn. And um, we bought a house, my wife and I, we've just been married for a few years and bought a house, um, thought we'd been very responsible in doing that in a number of ways uh, that the market had kind of bottomed and then it just fell off a cliff. And we ended up losing that home, having to short sell it. It was an incredibly painful process for me um, and journey because I had lost my own home when I was 16 uh, or 17, right around there, and um, just could not believe that I was back in that same kind of scenario and set of emotions as our economy just fell off a cliff 2006, 2007, 2008. And, um, you know, we, we kind of stuck it out for a couple couple years and then eventually realized that the economics would just not work and we had to, we had to begin looking for a new call. Um, we just had our first child and and so what happened was we moved out to the Pacific Northwest, got a call to a church that was trying to do youth ministry more intergenerationally. And um, I realized, because I tend to think in terms of economics, I realized pretty quickly that um, this downturn was actually going to be a massive wealth shift in our country. A lot of people were going to be priced out of the market permanently. That was very frustrating and figured out a creative way to find private financing to buy the biggest, the smallest junker home I could find, we could find. And it was an absolute junker. Um, it was falling apart and came up with the crazy idea that somehow I could remodel this thing. Let me show you this little video. This is day two going back into my house. Uh, oh, Lord. Um, after we'd started to demo it. Let me play this for you.
So I I can't even hardly show this this video to my wife because it's it was such a scary deal. I I don't really know that much about construction. I knew just <laughs> just enough to get myself in trouble, and um. You know, I had a couple friends from the church who said, we can help you rewire it. You probably should rewire this house because it's falling apart and it's so old and everything else. And little by little, we started to remodel this thing. I had to pay contractors to do some of it um, and things like that. But eventually, we ended up with this nice little 1937 built home. And um, along the way, what started to happen was I started hiring students who I was losing relationship with because our upper middle class youth ministry model didn't I knew we'd lose them after about two years and I thought well I wonder if I pay them uh to come and work they would learn something about work and life and we could actually talk about what they're really going through in ways that we can't get to at youth group and I worked jobs growing up from the age of nine onward um and you know value work inherently and I thought well that'd be kind of cool so I hired just a few kids just for a few hours you know maybe on a Saturday here and there to come out and would pay them um, to come and work on this house with me. And eventually the room that I'm sitting in right now, this single car garage was the second project. And as I did that, adults from the church started showing up and they'd bring air compressors and like lumber. And I felt like, uh, I felt like I was like, uh, you know, Tom Sawyer whitewashing the fence. I, I was like convincing all these people to show up at my house and do all the work for me in some ways. It was crazy, but they, they were showing up because they wanted to connect with the kids that, that I knew, and some of them were kids from our church, and it mattered to them to get to see them. And so we started building this thing, and the students are getting hired. And I'm like, you know, why why couldn't we do youth ministry more like this? Um, what would it what would it look like to do youth ministry in this kind of way? And um, I felt like we were getting in kind of better, you know, conversations and things. And I just thought, man, it would be so much more compelling to 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 do it like this. And it's kind of what I grew up with, with work service projects. And that's what it felt like was an extended work service project. And what I didn't know at the time was I was breaking employment law. And I was like, man, I better go figure this out. So I went off and read teenage employment law in Washington State for a couple months and realized I couldn't do construction with teenagers. There was no way. But what I figured out I could do was landscaping. And this is really where the idea started to take off from remodeling the house to realizing what was possible. Again, I knew almost nothing about landscaping. I, I had mowed my own lawns growing up, but really didn't know the first thing about fertilizing a lawn or anything else, but decided to build a, a landscaping company. It's called Motown Teen Lawn Care. It still exists. It's one of our programs. Motown um, started, I started as a for-profit landscaping company because my church was in the middle of a capital campaign and I knew they wouldn't feel comfortable they're already nervous about the money and everything else they wouldn't feel comfortable funding it so i just funded it myself and i also did as a for-profit because i had heard that at the time it was very difficult to start a nonprofit, and i wasn't ready to manage a board yet and so i created motown teen lawn care with about ten thousand dollars of my own money initially um it was felt like a big risk and then eventually about twenty five thousand because i had to buy like a pickup truck and other stuff and started uh, mowing lawns. And this is really important for you to know as you as you hear this is that initially it all started very, very small. Whatever you see me explain about this model, I want you to understand. I want you to remember this image right here. This is me standing next to the church trailer that we had um, attached to one of the church vans. This is my first day going to mow a lawn on my own to test this idea out. And it was horrible. I bounced a bunch of landscaping equipment out onto the roadway, Mill Plain Avenue in Vancouver, Washington, while driving there because I didn't hitch my trailer clothes properly. Um, I got to the house, the triplex, the grass was like two feet high. It took me three hours to mow the lawn. Um, and I ran out of gasoline. The grass was so thick. I bent a mower blade uh, hitting a lava rock that was hidden in the grass. I mean, it was awful. Um, and for some reason, I managed to just convince myself that this still wasn't a bad idea and it grew little by little over time. We, we've grown now. These are some of the students involved in our program. I'll tell you more about the scale and size. We do leaf cleanup and we spread mulch. We care for commercial properties. Um, this is a actually a free job that we did because somebody gave us a donation. We're now a nonprofit. Somebody gave us a donation um, to help folks in need who needed landscaping. 
a particular family at this house, both uh, individuals had, had recently gotten a cancer diagnosis and um, were really kind of hard up financially. And so um, we sent our students out to just come and do a massive cleanup on their house um, as just a, an act of love. Um, and we have all the equipment and gear we needed to do it. And so I really didn't intend to do a lot of this. It just sort of, I kept staggering into new corners of these ideas and they kept me going. I'd say, oh, this makes a lot of sense in terms of what I believe about God or what I think about students. So as we started the landscaping company, then we started talking about, well, this is really about getting teens ready for life, having them experience some of the rescue, salvation of God. Like, what does that look like? So we started with three life skills trainings. I think initially we did professionalism. How, do you, how would you hold down a job? Uh, I think we did money management and a personal goal setting training. We now have like a conflict resolution training, a much more in-depth goal setting training. Um, oh, and we do oh several other trainings around that. I'm, I'm drawing blanks right now, but we, um, we do uh, up to five or six trainings a year with the students that we do. Then we started to build in over time, you know, in the initial trainings were with like eight or nine students. Then we started to build in one-on-one -on -one mentoring with people that we trusted from our community that we knew very well, because we had a sense that if we're really going to transform the lives of students and care for them, then it's going to take more significant kind of time and involvement to be with them. And so we, uh, we started doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Now we do some video trainings for mentors that we just send home like quick Vimeos that I'll send home and just do on my phone to kind of, as a mentor is getting ready to go to meet with a student, something that they can think about, et cetera. And our initial goal was to reach 12 students and then it was 25 and it's kind of grown from there, but it really all started with that landscaping company called Motown. Any questions so far that I've missed in the chat area would be worth hearing. Folks feel free to add in there, but keep, keep going Matt. I think folks sure. are musing at the moment. So, you know, I, I, uh, a friend of mine um, gave me this image because he worked in this sphere long before I did. When I started this, I didn't know what social enterprise was. I had no idea that a huge number of business schools around the United States and other things were talking about social enterprise, which really, you know, one definition is, is this one you're looking at, which is just sort of the blending of kind of traditional nonprofit work with traditional for-profit work and traditional government aid work. And so it's really about making impact through the marketplace in a lot of ways, which is what I was doing, but I just, I just did it because it seemed like a good idea. And a, a friend of mine called me because um, I saw something they posted online and I said, tell me about like what you're doing. And when they found out what I was doing, they said, man, this is exactly what we're talking about. The church needs to move towards. So social enterprise is really, you know, engaging the marketplace, um, trying to do business, but with a good and a kingdom end in my vocabulary in mind. And um, I'm very passionate about it. I have a bent towards this as I've, as I've said, um, but I just didn't know it existed um, or you could think about it this way. And largely that conversation has been driven by particularly uh, the millennials and now Gen Z saying, look, we don't just want to go work for 40 years and then try to give our money away if we have any at retirement to make a good impact. Why can't we make impact along the way in our careers? How would we do that? And so they've really forced the kind of breaking down of some of these firewalls, these traditional firewalls within these worlds in ways that are getting people to rethink how you could use capital or how you could build a business to do good with it. And so I unintentionally waded into this world not knowing it existed simply because I had an idea to work with students. Matt, we got a couple of uh, of questions, and I think you're I think you're going in these directions, but feel free to to ponder yeah, these. Absolutely. So, yeah, one is uh, wondering how you develop the models for life skills training, uh, and another um, the how do we incorporate Christian education into this model of social? Yeah. Enterprise. So the skills are really I think where that comes up. So. Um, some of the skills trainings came because churches I'd worked with previously had summer internships for young adults, like college students that would come back to help a little bit with, with youth ministry. And so what, what, what I noticed, one of the things that I paid attention to a lot of like a good idea is just paying attention to what go, is going on around you. And like, you know, we do, we do little like uh, mini trainings during these summer internships and we do things from like, Hey, how to share about your faith story and how to do a personal devotion. Um, how to do like the Ignatian examine. Like we, these would be the trains we do, 
But all of a sudden I noticed that the training that the students were most interested in was money management. Like for three years running, that was the number one thing that they were concerned about. And I was like, okay, if I'm a good minister and I care about these kids, why are they, they are, they are so worried about this. I need to pay attention to that. So a lot of it came out of stuff I was already tinkering with. Again, I think most entrepreneurial ideas come out of stuff you're already doing and you com combine it in new ways. So it was, it was part of that. Um, you know, like I said, I lost my house when I was 16. The reason I did the financial money management training was because nobody in my household ever talked about money because it was a disaster. And it was an honors English teacher that suspended a class for two days in high school to teach us about retirement, social security, managing credit card debt. And as a teenager, I was fascinated by that because there was this pocket of fear in my household about this topic. And I held on to that. And then I was like, you know what? I don't want any of the kids in my youth group to not know anything about money. And I, for, so, so it mattered to me. Now, here's where the gospel and discipleship comes into it and Christian formation. It's not about money management for me. This isn't about maximizing kids' money. This is about stewardship. Christians should be concerned about any resource that they have, whether it's an ounce of it or a million pounds of it, to say, how can this resource that I have be used for the greater glory and good of God's kingdom in the world? And so every training we do, we design, I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll get to say a little bit more about this later, but we live in the tension of creating trainings and models that appeal to students while trying to counterbalance that using those as vehicles to bring the disruptive ethics of the kingdom into it. So we do goal setting. I don't give a rip about personal goal setting, but our culture does. Our culture thinks that the recipe for finding life is success. So fine. All right. You want to show up for goal setting? I'll do goal setting. But what we're actually interested in, in getting them to do is ask, why do you want the things that you want? And who will you become along the way in trying to get those things? And that by speaking to something that they feel like speaks to what they think the culture has assigned to them as what they're supposed to do and who they're supposed to be, it allows you to get inside the minutia of their life and then disrupt it with the very disruptive kingdom ethics. So when we talk about goal setting, we talk about the fact that you can achieve everything you want and be a very miserable human being. And that in fact, the question of why you want what you want may be the most important question that you ask. Just because you can achieve something does not mean that it is virtuous or good. Um, one of the mantras that I like that comes from a youth ministry, a friend of mine named Mark uh, Iaconelli, um, he talks about it. There's a sociologist, I think from San Diego State, who, who said, you know, the three great lies of our culture are you are what you do, you are how much you do it, and you are how well you do it. And I believe that, that vast portions of our culture believe those three lies. And so we're trying to get them to question that ethic, even while we're doing it through, say, the medium of goal setting. Um, professionalism isn't about just doing a job really well. That's about vocation. Like we do a personality profile as well. It's not about you knowing your Myers-Briggs. It's about figuring out how has God wired me such that I could harness that to find joy, not only for myself, but especially for the sake of my neighbor. Um, professionalism for us is about, man, if I'm going to send a kid out to be a plumber or electrician, I want, my ideal would be that they understand that God has given them those gifts and that the way that they go about that work has the opportunity to bless their world incredibly. That if, you, if, 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 you're, if you're a plumber and you do that work well, that family does not have to worry about a pipe breaking under their house for the next five years. And that is a glory to God kind of thing. We just don't think of it that. We don't think of that as ministry, but it is. So it's, it's, we, we definitely appeal to some of what our students think they should be concerned with, but the goal is to kind of disrupt it with the kingdom ethics that were there. I hope that kind of gets at that question a little bit. And you'll see that's a, a tension that we live in the whole time. I feel like this whole, I think most of theology is like this, but this whole ministry is about balancing um, tensions between the ministry and the business part, but there's a million tensions. Um, you could even call them paradoxes at times, and our faith is littered with those. And this only adds another layer of those to our discernment process as we walk through ministry.
So let me go back to my uh, yeah. my screen share here. Matt, um, yeah, folks, feel free to, to add, ask follow-up questions in the chat about that. I feel like Matt just threw out about 15 nuggets of wisdom for us. Um, quick qu follow-up question uh, with regards to financial money management. Matt, yeah. uh, someone is asking about, um, they would love to bring financial money management to their youth and youth and young adults. Who do you recommend for this? Are there any progressive voices who are really working hard at putting out some good resources for that? Do you know, I don't know. And that's been a particular bent of mine. It's probably actually, I would consider it even a flaw is I just tend to build my own stuff. I, I, um, I'm pretty independent guy. And so I, that's, you know, that's a problem. Like the, the places that we borrowed the most from other learning materials has been mostly around like empathy and listening um, and not around our actual practical trainings. And, and, and you know what, that's actually probably come from years of youth ministry experience of not trusting curriculum because most of it's not theologically reflective. So I've always had to build my own stuff because I, I just felt like it's either misunderstood the gospel or misunderstood students completely. And so when it comes to those practical trainings, it's been a mix of just stuff we've grabbed from all over and said, yep, that, that's something we, we can line up with or make sense to us, et cetera. Um, I, you know, I wish I, gosh, I wish I could point you to some resource that we just built our own money management trainings. I mean, just, and it's, it's simple stuff. I mean, we're just talking about interest rates and inflation and a savings account and credit cards and, you know, things like that. It's nothing real, real complicated. Um, it, it's stuff like that. So I, there, there, I can't point, I wish I could point you to a really gr great set of resources, progressive or otherwise that I've used. And I just haven't. I Sounds I like, like fodder for thought for the next book or something, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe it's like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, when I got my first paycheck as a minister, like I went out and just bought like, I think it was like money management for dummies, you know, it's like one of the four dummies books. And so I just have taken what I've learned and then popped it into some of these things. There are other places you'll see where we were, we're using, uh, c c you know, concepts, but most of that has been around training our mentors not so much about the presentation material, because honestly, it's not even about the trainings, y'all. Like, that's the thing that's changed for us. It's about the relationships. And it's about the transformation that comes through having deep relationships with people that care about you and that want to invest in your lives. And so honestly, the trainings, if you, if you really push me on it, I think they're of value. But I think most of that stuff is stuff that they're either going to tuck away in their back pocket or not for the future. And it's really about us getting, using those trainings to open up conversation about real life where we can offer um, empathetic understanding and care and the love of God for our neighbor. Um, and that's really what it's about. So, um, and we've even had to adjust our sense of this because I think we started with such a heavy bent on the trainings that it felt like that's what it's about. It's like, no, that's, not, that's never what this has been about. Um, this is about people believing they are inherently valuable in the eyes of God, that they're valuable to their neighbor, that they have hope and a purpose and joy. It's about the gospel for us, all the things the gospel would want us to have and coming alive as human beings. So um, uh, why social enterprise? So for me, one of the things that bothered me is I, you know, I, I got into some reading on asset-based community development, a, a small book named toxic called toxic charity. I think by Bob Lupton, really got me thinking about the way my church had done mission. Um, and I had enough study of missiology, you know, the history of the missionary movement to understand the abusive ways that that's been done. And I started to take those templates of kind of negative work that we've done in missions. And when I laid it over the top of youth ministry in general, I was like, man, I feel like we're doing some of the same, uh, committing some of the same sins with students in our youth ministries. We, we offer them these programs um, a lot of my kids, if they're not like upper middle class, require scholarships to, be, to like go places and be a part of them. And I started to wonder how much dignity am I taking away from students? Um, I think that's why we would lose some of our kids after two or three years, because either youth group was just kind of fluffy, sort of fun, or for some of our low income kids is like, oh, this isn't my kind of place. Like this is, these people are not speaking my language and, and they got tired of being offered a scholarship to go on a trip. And I started to ask questions about dignity and empowerment. And I found that the social enterprise world was very concerned with that. I have an economics bent. I, when, and what I mean by economics for me, I'm not like some uber capitalist marketplace kind of guy or whatever. 
Um, I, I do think the marketplace, when it's done healthily, can create some equal exchanges if it's done right. But I think about economics mostly in terms of I like to think about how people manage their time and resources, recognizing that they're not unlimited. And you have to pay attention to that to understand what drives rationally or irrationally what drives their thinking and the way they interact with things. So I think my students uh, economic picture of time had shifted and therefore their view of the value of youth ministry had completely shifted. They didn't really see it as valuable anymore. They could get they could get the same things in other places because because there was nothing particularly compelling or honestly, and sometimes in some forms of youth ministry, there's nothing even particularly gospel centered about the way the youth ministry is done. So the value proposition had shifted. So I, I had an economic spent. Um, I, as I said, I was concerned about sustainability. One of the reasons I love social enterprise um, is because it requires excellence and specificity. My friend, Kenda Dean, who you heard mentioned earlier, you know, likes to ask the question, you know, when you think about going to a church potluck, what do you think about? And, you know, my answer to that question has always been at least the ones I grew up with was like jello mold. Like, that's what I thought about. I was like, those, those crazy jello molds, you know, with the fruit sustained, you know, floating midway in the middle of them. And that no one, like, it's really sad, but like a lot of people approach our churches and they don't think about excellence when they think about church in anything. And that kind of like breaks my heart. And what I love about social enterprise is like, if you take my, the landscaping operation, I'll tell you about our other operations here in a second. But if you take our landscaping operation, like that whole model, the ability to employ students, to provide a living wage, to do all the things that we do stands or falls on our ability to do that work superbly well. And I like that idea. It, 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 I find it compelling that you have to do it very excellently. And you also have to do it very specifically. The church, and this is not the church's fault in some ways, in some ways it is because of the position of power it put itself in culturally over his, you know, its history. But the church was kind of assigned the cultural role of being all things to all people. And as a result, oftentimes has struggled with settling on specific things or specific areas it really wants to focus in on to help or to do kingdom work. Well, social enterprise demands that you come up with a very specific idea. I can't have like a landscape company ministry that's also selling ice cream and doing games it, like that won't work it, it has to focus on one thing and then really center in on that and say okay how can the how can the gospel live into this thing that we're doing and i could talk more about that later during the question time like okay what does it look like to do the gospel and landscaping like how does that work we could talk about that in a little bit um but it's also social enterprises adaptable to different kinds of students from different parts of society. It's adaptable to different adults with different bents or gifts. Um, there have been adults that have just walked in and said, well, if this is what ministry looks like, I can do this. Like I can be a part of this, but youth group, no way. Um, doing this, that, or the other, no way. But this I can actually engage with and can see, oh, if, if God can use my gifts in this way, then I'm all about it. So it, it, it'll, I think social enterprises, you can use it to inhabit a bunch of different places across a society or church. Um, I'll skip over this. I can come back to it later. Now, this is what the forge looks like five years on. So again, we started really, really small. Um, but the Columbia Future Forge is a 501c3 nonprofit that has underneath it Motown Teen Lawn Care, uh, a secondary program called Utmost Athletics, which is an affordable sliding scale uh, strength training program. I can tell you more about it in a minute. Um, it's basically a, a kind of a weight room sort of gym and students pay on a sliding scale to be a part of that. We scholarship some of them. Uh, and then we have a variety of school partnerships. The main one we do is uh, with a school called Hayes Freedom. It's kind of an alternative high school. And we take all of their freshmen at their request through our life skills trainings that we do. And uh, that's been a little tricky this year, obviously, with COVID. Um, we did have a drone piloting program that we did for a while getting kids commercially licensed as drone pilots because we had a sense that that was going to be a growing industry. It's, it's not been, and students weren't as interested in it as we thought they would be, so we let it go. We just abandoned it and focused on our school partnerships instead. I would love it if we had about another three of these that were all sort of under the umbrella of the Forge, which is basically what the Forge is. It's the umbrella program that, um, that oversees. It's the umbrella nonprofit. Um, and we've had people come to us and come knocking on the door with different ideas. I could talk more about those at the end. 
Um, but this will give you a sense of kind of what our organization kind of looks like. Um, and I obviously I don't manage all of these. I have volunteers and other folks and some paid employees that manage each of these areas at this point. Um, Matt, a question about pay, actually, if I yeah. can interrupt you for a sec. Um, someone is asking, how do we offer payment or employment in churches with little to no budget? Uh, this person says they're offering trainings, but youth with jobs would rather be at the jobs earning money than being somewhere where they don't get money. Right. What we found, um, let's see if I understand that question right. Like, like, can you give me that question one more time. I want to make sure I understand it. Yeah, and Andrew, feel, feel free to unmute yourself if I get this wrong. Um, but yeah, uh, wondering about how to offer payment, I think, to youth uh, in churches that really don't have the budget for that sort of thing and oh. losing the youth to their jobs rather than you know getting this wonderful skills training and uh, just losing losing youth to employment when churches can't right. afford that. Well, so, so the interesting part, you're going to see when I share some of the numbers, but there's never been a point at which Motown itself has not been able to pay its students or pay for itself. It doesn't require extra church funding because it generates revenue. Clients pay for us to mow their lawns and the revenue stream that it generates. And this is part of the, what I see is the beauty of social enterprise is it allows us to create revenue and then reinvest it back in kingdom work. And there are kids that are employed with say Motown uh, we actually have some student employees of utmost as well, utmost athletics, who then um, they do uh, end up bouncing to other jobs uh, or they do the life skills and that's it. And they, they go on and do other things. But to us, that's not a loss. We, we've actually found that we've actually been able to extend relationship with church kids, but then also impact the lives of kids that would never come through the doors of our church. In fact, that's part of the model. It's an outreach based model. And my attitude is, is that, look, if, if, if nothing else, if I have a kid come through the doors of my youth center and I've gotten them ready for the next 20 years of life in some way, then I have done them a great service. Um, one of our theme verses is James 2.16. If I tell you to go in peace but I, um, but I, and eat your fill, but I don't put food in your stomach or clothes on your back, what good have I done you? And I was struck by that because you know, six, seven years ago, we baptized these two kids at our church that were pretty rough and tumble. And the church was over there, you know, just patting itself on the back for having done that. And, it, 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 and justifiably so. We were loving these kids. It was great. But I'm driving them home one night after youth group and dropping them off. And I'm dropping one of them off to a trailer with no running water. And another one who's living with grandma because dad had run a little, granddad had, had won a little bit of money in the lottery and walked out on him. And I'm driving home just thinking, and that verse hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm thinking to myself, what happens to these kids in two years? So we got them baptized. Wonderful. I mean, I, I suppose Jesus is dancing about that someplace. But is he also lamenting the fact that we haven't cared one bit for the life, the here and now life that's right around the corner for them? So for me, I would love it if every kid that came in really got to understood, got to a place of understanding that they're made in the image of God and that Christ has called them into this really compelling life. But, but I'm not going to be manipulative to do that. And, and, and that's not what you're suggesting. I know. Um, but not only that, I, I would still feel like I had served them really well. Even if I just helped them to learn how to put food in their mouth by holding down a job, I would feel like there's great glory given to God in doing that kind of work. So for me, there's not one finished project product in this model. And I'm very big on that in my youth ministry and my philosophy of ministry is um, I never want to try to get a kid to a destination in such a way that I end up being controlling or manipulative. And I think we are all tempted to do that in ministry because we invest hours in human beings and then we expect there to be some kind of turnaround or emotional payoff for us being who we are as broken human beings. And we get disappointed when that doesn't happen. I don't want to put myself in that kind of place of control or coercion in the life of a kid or an adult ever. So for me, I'm, I'm open to kids kind of coming and going. And if the opportunity opens up to really talk about the, the deep uh, spiritual corners of life that God has invited me into, oh man, I'm delighted to do that. But it doesn't always happen. Does that, oh, Andrew, I don't know if you can chat in, but does that help answer your question maybe?
I hope so. Yes. Yes. Okay. He wrote in the chat. Yep. Thanks, Jill. Uh, yeah, there are a couple, Matt, there are a couple of other questions, uh, a lot of them pertaining to your relationship with your congregation in the yeah. midst of this. Do you want me to go there or are you going to go let's, in that direction? Let's hold off a little bit. Let me see where okay. we are time. Let's hold off just a little bit. Sure. And okay, so you have a half hour left. So let me let me go on for a little bit. I'll try and not belabor this too much. Um, So this is a student I work with, with Dylan. To give an example, Dylan has uh, worked with both um, our Motown and worked out with Utmost Athletics. This is, I took him to the local fire station to a firefighter I knew out in the community because he was interested in firefighting. His folks um, had come to the United States and really wanted him to be a doctor. And the end result of that was he ended up at a science tech school, Henrietta Lacks High School in our area. And the only program that really appealed to him was like being a dental assistant, but he hated that by about the end of the first year and was trying to figure out what's he called to do. So part of our work with Dylan was like kind of going through his gifts assessment and personality profile and trying to let Dylan work out for himself amongst his family, what faithfulness looks like and how to honor the wishes of his parents. I didn't want to be in the middle of that, but to also allow him to come to terms with himself and, and figure out what does he really want out of life? What is it that he's wired to do and ultimately, he's actually, he's gotten himself enrolled to college and is doing fine with that. He was scholarshiped in a four-year school. We helped him navigate that, get enrolled, kind of work through that process. But now I said, you know, I might come back to this later, but this is not for me. I'd like to go learn how to be an electrician because I love to work with my hands. It's a good living. I could support my parents and the rest of my family that way. That's what I want to go and do. So we like to really say, again, we, we try to, to, I think do what i don't believe that our god is coercive and so we try to build a ministry that you know allows students to discover who god has made them to be and ask questions about some of what they want um but really allow them to shape part of their uh their journey for themselves and our job is accompaniment in a lot of ways along that with some guidance and some input critical feedback sometimes um and asking hard questions that maybe they haven't asked but um, this would be like an example of kind of a student that we work with. Uh, I brought Ashley into this because Ashley just finished her um, cosmetology school. She got licensed as a beautician just the other day. We were so stoked on this. Her family kind of drug her to our program because they were worried she was holed up in her room, you know, virtually the entire day and night just on her phone. And they didn't know what to do with that and brought her in. We got her hooked up with a mentor who was like, a, she was into like jewelry making and worked with like horses. And those were totally off Ashley's map. But because that particular woman was so driven in her own life and figured out how to create her own jewelry business, she was able to help Ashley figure out how to say, hey, if you want to go be a beautician, if you love working with people's hair and everything else, then let's go figure out how to help you get there. And that's what we did. And we just, we, we, we litter those conversations with, you know, our own faith. Like this is, this is how I see my life and my purpose in the world. And students are welcome to take that or leave it. That's kind of how we go about doing the, doing the ministry. Um, let me give you some details. This might help you a little bit. Um, we are a 501c3 at this point with an independent board and financial oversight. There's about 150 total young adults is how we describe them now, not just not teenagers or youth, because we think every every teenager is kind of an adult in training one way or the other. There's 40 to 50 folks that have become engaged in this project in our church, which is a really high number for any kind of project at our church. Um, there's 20 people employed uh, that were employed in 2020, 10 of those on a real consistent basis. We're kind of excited about the idea that we're we have an economic engine that supports people meaningfully in their lives. There's 15 students only right now currently in direct mentoring. We would have expected that number to be maybe 35 to 40 this year, except that um, that COVID really got in the way of that and messed all that up on a whole bunch of levels. But if we are going to look at those relationships, I'd say we have 60 impact relationships in which we're involved regularly enough during the week that we're impacting the lives of students. So for instance, the weight training program, if you're a part of that, you're there three days a week for an hour and 15 minutes. We used to do a meal once a month with them as well. 
and and then build the life skills on the end of that. So we actually had a lot of hours with the kids involved in that program, whereas Motown, you're pulling kids out for maybe a six-hour job on a Saturday. It depends on how frequently you can get those jobs that students can actually work to be able to do that. Um, 15 to 20 percent of our students are minority students. 45 percent of our employees are minority employees. And I think, I can't read it with this silly bar at the bottom of Zoom, but I think 12 to 15 percent of our mentors are uh, minority-based mentors. Um, and we've, we've tried, I, I think we still have a lot of room to grow in that aspect to re really reflect the communities that are around us. Um, and also a lot of work to do, I think, in training our mentors properly in uh, just awareness of race dynamics, socioeconomic dynamics, a whole bunch of assumptions that we bring into our relationships as mentors because of our particular upbringing, uh, our, our you know, kind of position that we occupy in the community. And that's work that we're trying to be attentive to, but we still have a long way to grow in terms of that. Um, the Forge offers like an umbrella support network at this point. It helps us do the theological reflection on the ministry. Compensation, here's how this works to so get an idea of somewhat how this interacts. I am not directly compensated for my work in this, but the church pays my salary and allows me to do this on the side. Um, and that's been a bit of a beast to try to do sort of two and a half jobs at once over the last five years. Um, my church, CPC, that's Columbia Presbyterian Church, does offer some support. But interestingly enough, it only offers 15K in direct support to this a year. Um, we have raised throughout the community. We, are on, we expect we'll have 32,000 in donations this year from people out in the community, which is actually a really small number. And only one grant that we think we'll get this year for 25,000. Our annual budget is 387,000. Um, and so the interesting part is, is um, like two things. Somebody brought up resources. Like it's been remarkable. We've built this sort of bootstrap, this thing from the ground up because it generates revenue without needing a ton of direct support um, as a side project. The second thing I'll say, and we should come back to this later is I think you have way more resources at your disposal than you realize. And we should really come back to that here. I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, uh, Jill, don't let me lose sight of that, if you would, because um, I, I really want to have a conversation about that, because I think that's part of enlivening our imagination about what's possible. Um, this is our last supper we do with our graduates, where they talk about what they've learned from one another, the mentors and the students um, that we typically would do. We can't do it right now. Um, this year is from, a, I think, a couple of years ago. This is a student who painted their hammer and anvil. Every time a kid gets a job, whether it's with us or out in the community, we spray paint a hammer and anvil on the side of our youth, our, our youth building um, at our church, um, which is kind of fun. They've let us do that. This is the inside of our weight room. It is all very high-end D1 grade athletic equipment. Um, probably as an initial investment of about $55,000 to pull this off. Um, but we managed to figure out how to scrap that together. And it's incredible. And the reason I love that it's high end, like we've had people kind of twist our arm and say, could we get secondhand equipment? Well, we could, we could do that, but we were convinced that we wanted every kid that walked in this space. I've been in so many programs in my community where low income kids are given a space that I don't think is worthy of them. And it, it drives me crazy. And I think, you know, for just a little bit more effort and some creative thinking about how to finance things or build a sustainable business model, I have kids that walk into this space and this is the most glorious space that they walk into in their week. I walked into the County jobs program six years ago. And I remember walking into the portable and my mom was a school teacher and I walked into the portable for this alternative education model. And it was designed to do job skills trainings for kids. And I immediately could see that we had secondhand whiteboards, secondhand desks. These were the portables that had been falling apart on other campuses and had been trucked over to this sort of district office area. And I just thought to myself, that sends a powerful message to these students when they come in that this is supposed to help them into their future. I want to send a completely different message to every kid that walks through our door uh, when they come to, to be a part of this ministry. That's that excellence idea. And I think it's possible. I think we have more resources at our disposal than we realize. And we, we, again, we'll talk about more of that later. We had to rebuild the whole gym outdoors during COVID, which is insane. This has been an exhausting season. This is it. Once we got canopies done, we had to go out and find 
people who are willing to give us old cargo containers we cut the sides out of and everything else is crazy to try to figure out how to do this for our weight program, but we managed to pull it off. These are my two lead landscapers. They are, they go out during the week to keep the business running. Um, they're my crew bosses. Um, uh, Santiago, uh, Jesus Victoriano and Cornelio, they're brothers. And um, they're incredible folks. We've offered them, I think, an economic opportunity and ended up doing ministry in their lives that we didn't expect. So, for instance, right now, you know, they're, uh, they're getting English lessons from a woman from our church, Hispanic Latino woman, whose son also works for Motown. And, and we talk about that a lot in this thing. Like, we end up doing ministry within the ministry because of what social enterprise is. It just it opens up all these layers of impact and missional engagement that you you would not have conceived of. I think C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle writes, when entering the kingdom of God, they keep like opening, the characters keep opening up doors and it's like a better version of the room they were in previously, like further in and higher up is I think what they're yelling throughout the last chapter of that book. And I, I, I hear that mantra regularly when we, we think we're in one room of ministry and then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, this is supposed to be what we're doing too. Like, I never thought we'd have a donor step forward or write a check to say, man, if, if those guys, children need, need to be able to pay for preschool, let's get them into preschool so they're learning early. And I'd like to pay for tutoring for them if they want it. And they were like, absolutely, we would like that. And so I, it's just, there's lots of ministry around the ministry. I could tell you story after story after story about impact and conversations in people's backyards while mowing. It's really cool. I'll tell you being a minister. And standing in somebody's backyard to measure their lawn, and all of a sudden you're a half hour into a conversation about loss or grief um, or their own children's experience struggling to become an adult. Um, there's a whole ministry that goes on doing landscaping or the weight training or, or anything else that we've done um, on school campuses. And, and, and it's worth hearing that. And it's so joyous to do that, to do that work. Uh, do you have any other questions that have opened up that I should answer at this point? We have several, uh, and folks, I'll name, you know, keeping an eye on time and just scope of conversation. Uh, if we do not get to your question in this section, one of the gifts that I get is that Matt and I will have a chance to have a subsequent interview, and I will bring each and every one of these questions. Those clips will appear on our website, so by the end of this month, you will certainly have answers to your questions, so please do check out our website if we don't get to it right now. Um, but a couple, so let's see, a couple of questions, Matt. Um, one is uh, uh, a little bit about how to transition from youth group work into this, uh, the traditional youth group model into this kind of enterprise. So the main oppositions that you experienced when trying yeah. to initiate something like this and also, um, you know, startup costs and how to how to get that off the ground. You mentioned a ten thousand dollar investment of your own money. Um, so we'll we'll start with those two. Yeah. So um, okay, let's start. Like uh, I did a uh, I think there's some for somebody actually on this call. I did a series of videos on innovation, and one of the things I said that the most imp important thing is you start out thinking about how to do something like differently. Is I is I say consider your soil conditions, um, and by that, I mean both the, the context that you're in in terms of a church. Um, do you know yourself well enough to know what your strengths and your weaknesses are? Have you done enough self-exploration to know what your strengths and, and interests are to know whether you can actually pull an idea that you have off? Um, so it's really important. In terms of like church stuff, there's a lot of churches that this would not have worked at. And there's a lot of assets that I have at my disposal in terms of a church. Like my church is a traditional church. But at some point it acquired like this little mini market supermarket that was next to its property and turned that into the church offices. Well, the back 20% of that was storage. And I just convinced the church, like, what if we cleared that storage out and made it more efficient? We could put a weight room in there. And there's this guy out in the community who wants to do that. And he's got a year of theology seminary under his belt in the past. Like, why wouldn't we do that? And my church, because it, it, it's very, it's like traditional in a lot of ways. Uh, really a lot of ways it's, it's very vanilla. Like if, if you were looking for a flashy church, you would not come to our church. Like, but it, it has a capacity to trust its leadership. 
It has a capacity to put up with a certain amount of experimenting for the sake of the glory of God. Like it really, it's willing to do that. And so I'm very aware that you might have the world's greatest idea and it might be, um, it might be, you know, uh, not the right time or the right place for you to launch that idea. In fact, there was a guy that reached out to me from Texas some weeks ago, you know, he wanted to start landscaping. This was just before COVID. And when I talked to him, I said, I said, well, like, tell me about yourself. What are you into? Well, I learned that he was like a double black belt in like Taekwondo or something and had been a part of like a series of like franchise Taekwondo businesses. Like he'd been there from the ground up. And, and then he's like, oh, yeah, my church has this empty space out back on, on like an acre. And I was like, well, why the heck would you want to do landscaping? Like, why, why on earth would you punish yourself with landscaping? Because tell, let me tell you, it's not fun. And, and I'm like, why wouldn't you just start like a, a dojo and build your faith into that? And, and so, you know, a lot of times it's figuring out, you know, in his church, unfortunately, his church would not, they couldn't get their imagination around to seeing how those things came together. Indeed, a friend of mine came and visited me, um, and and I asked him why he wanted to come and see what we were doing, and and he's and I you know at like anyways I'll, you know I'll spare you the details, but he he came and said the reason I want to come and see why or how you did this is why your church didn't fire you for coming in the room, and there's some reasons why I think that didn't happen. Part of it was my church's personality. Part of it was I built trust by doing the main job well for four years before I ever, they were going to trust me with enough dice to roll across the table. Trust is a huge part of this. I also am an ordained minister. I have a certain, and I'm a dude. And that probably gives me a certain amount of privilege within the system that other people wouldn't have in theirs. So there's all these dynamics of power and opportunity that are in there that you really do have to, as Jesus would say, you have to count the cost. You've got to think about, man, am I going to want to landscape at year three? Or I don't know, you could do a jewelry business or an ice cream cart or a food truck or where, like you got to count the cost of what carrying that thing around at year three is going to feel like. And then think about where they're going to allow you to kind of, to kind of do it. So there's a whole bunch of things to weigh out and discern prayerfully, prayerfully before you go launching in. That's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Let's just Another. keep firing questions. Jill, you and I can follow up on a little, some of the theology that undergirds this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if there's a couple more questions that I want to share about resources a little bit. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, one other question I'll hone in on right now is, you know, how do you, how do you make it transparent to your wider community and to those who are involved in your program that this is a Christian and faith-based endeavor? Yeah, that's been a fascinating dynamic. You know, like I'm in one of like the least church areas of the United States, right? The Pacific Northwest. And people often ask that. And you know what? It's never been a problem. Um, when I walk into the room with these ideas, like life skills, job skills, the weight training, drones, landscaping, whatever it is, that is that the goodness of that work is obvious, whether or not you're a faith-based person or not. And it's only a question then of, do you trust me? to be the kind of person who socially and intellectually is capable of, of like engaging students in a nuanced enough way that I'm not gonna hit them over the head with my particular religious message. And I find that people are, are actually quite willing to engage and trust with it. And part of what I love about those conversations, I would tell you, I don't wear a clerical collar, but there's certainly an imaginary one around my neck when they know I'm a minister. And when you walk in and, and only a couple of times have I had people kind of be a little resistant because, and you know, and I've learned to listen over the years because probably that means somewhere in their tree, they've had a horrible experience with religion. And, but it's been interesting that when people have really pushed on me and I've talked about what we emphasize, joy, discovering who you are, right? And getting people ready economically for the next stage of life. Only one time did I have to ask somebody, what about that are you opposed to? And the answer is, well, I'm not. So then are you just opposed to the fact that I'm a religious person? And that puts them in a little bit of an uncomfortable spot at that point, and it's never been an issue. And so I can imagine, though, I do have to be careful about the kind of adults that I bring in as mentors for a whole bunch of reasons, but I want to make sure that they are capable of existing socially 
in a responsible and nuanced way, even while being particularist about their Christian faith. And so far, we haven't had any issues with that. Um, but you do have to be intentional about it. But the work is so good, and we do it well enough. Schools really want people to be in relationship with kids. They want the help. They're struggling. And we just haven't had a good enough idea that's compelling enough for them to want us on campus or around. So I think it's possible. Yeah, that's super helpful, Matt. The, the other question is about mentor training. So maybe if you could wrap that into some conversation about resources. I, yeah, so I, we, yeah. mentor training, we started conceptually just looking at like, what are the kind of things you need to do to do ministry well? And I still say to this day, the number one thing that you need to do is listen um, and, uh, and try to relinquish as much control as possible. But we've done things like um, we, uh, we try to take those trainings that we do and then build modules that encourage the mentors to reflect before they go walking into a room talking about professionalism or sharing about their own experiences, getting them to reflect a little bit on, hey, how is your lived context and experience going to be potentially vastly different than your students? Or do you know yet enough about your student to be able to even share a story from your personal life. Um, we worked with uh, this last year, a book called uh, 15 Habits of Mind. It might be 16. I always screw the number. I'm a bad numbers person. Um, and the 15 Habits of Mind, you know, my sister used in her educational graduate program. And it looks at what are the 15 kind of habits that um, a healthy adults tend to embody. So we took those and then we worked them through a theological process. So like, um, one might be the ability to take risks or recover from failures. So we take that concept that we is valid, it's researched, it works well. And then we say, okay, what gospel gap does that speak to in our culture? So for instance, why are kids afraid to take risks? Well, because if they live in a culture in which success is a prize above all things, failure feels like an existential crisis. So, so they don't yet know that they are valuable apart from what they achieve. That's a gospel gap. Then we say, okay, what are the practical ways we could go about, um, uh, you know, helping with that? So if we listen better to them, if we shared maybe a short story about a failure that we recovered from, we train the mentors in this way. And then we would take that. And for those students that want to be spiritually engaged or already are as they come into our program, we then say, what are the theological concepts that speak to that gospel gap or that practical skill in a more robust way. And then we say, what are the scriptural stories, our stories that also speak directly to those moments? Recovery from failure. You could look at the reinstatement of Peter as an example, or like, right? There's all these different things um, that you can come up with from our narratives that, that are um, from the Bible that just, that speak to these things, the truth of them. So, that's kind of the process that we work, and then we try to put those in the hands of our mentors. Right now, I'm reading a book um, called The Body Keeps the Score, and it's looking at how you work with students who are dealing with uh, ACEs, ACEs students dealing with high levels of trauma throughout their lives. And I want to figure out how do I get that to ground with our mentors. Um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to train professional grade mentors necessarily. I'm training lay people who want to be involved with kids in their community. And those are two different things. They, they are. Mm. And, and I couldn't, if I wanted all professional mentors, I couldn't scale that. There's no way I could get more people involved in the lives of students. Okay, let me talk resources for a second, Jill. So I was at a, 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 a speaking thing. I got asked, I don't get asked these very often. Maybe a couple times a year, I'll, I'll do something like this. But I was at one last year and I'm in the basement of this church in Tennessee and someone says, well, how do you come up with the resources to do this? And cause not everybody has $10,000 in their pocket, which I'm very well aware of as much as that was a gamble for me and a risk. Like I'm aware of that. Um, but the person asked me that question in the basement of this church. And it was insane because I'm in the basement of a church that is so unbelievably wealthy and ornate in terms of land, untapped capital in terms of its people and everything else. I just thought that is a ridiculous question. I think the vast majority of our churches have unbelievable amounts of resources at their disposal. 
There is one church, one Episcopal church in New York City, to give you an example of this, that has a $6 billion endowment in this country. We, we are the biggest property owner in the United States, churches are. It's crazy. We, we do not suffer from a lack of resources. A friend of mine named Diamond that I met is from Indianapolis, who grew up in a very poor black community where his church was kind of centered, was sent out into his neighborhood. And one of the things he told me, he said, you know what? He said, in my community, a lot of people don't talk about the resources they have. He's like, but they're there. And they often, they'll keep them hidden. Certain gifts or talents that they have in the neighborhood, even money that they have. I think what we actually suffer from is a scarcity of imagination and will. And if we were willing to risk, part of the reason that people joined me, not only with their time and their energy and their money, was because they saw me risking for the sake of the gospel. And that risk was compelling to them to perhaps risk some of their time and their talent and their treasure as well. And risk is compelling. So I had to take a risk first for others to dip their toes in the water. And when I did that, I discovered that my community had even more resources than I realized. I didn't know that my denomination had some resources and funding that I actually went and looked for that were, that were there and available to them. And there's a huge set of resources, and this is what social enterprise is partially based around, other than people just giving to you or grants or tithing to the church. We have what's called the wallet economy. Every day in this country, there are trillions of dollars of transactions going on, and we just haven't figured out how to take the most compelling story in human history, right? That's how I view my story, the gospel, and we haven't figured out how to translate that into something so meaningful that people would not be stopped to give of themselves and their money and everything else they have to go and do it. And once you do that, People will fall all over themselves to lay their life down for something. And that is at the very center of the gospel. You show me what's worth dying for, and I will show you what's worth living for. That is at the heart of the Christian message. And I think you will find that resources are not our problem. Um, They are at times and moments, but they're not our main problem. And in fact, they can be the one thing that kills you. I'll say this. If I had started with a lot of resources... I would have bought all the wrong equipment. I would have built the operation in all the wrong ways. Abundance would have crushed me. It was having to figure it out and problem solve with bailing wire and running from my office to a job site and everything else that made the model better and more efficient and just different. And so I I, I would just encourage you to think about that. Start small. Do you have a van at your disposal? What could you do with it? Do you, uh, do you have a particular talent? Maybe it's knitting. My daughter sits out here and knits with like four ladies from our church and it's become like a club during COVID outdoors with a little heater on. It, like you could turn that into something. Think about what you like and what you're good at and say, man, what would it look like for me to do ministry with this? Do you like playing Dungeons and Dragons? What, why don't you go build a gaming, a gaming business or just build a club that does it? I mean, Think about how God has made you and what brings you joy and say, what could you do with students related to that? And don't think about it at scale. I never did this to scale it. I did it because I wanted to figure out how to do ministry better with students. I wanted to do ministry that gave glory to God more. And and, and once you start getting concerned with scaling and numbers and all this stuff, then you forget about the core process, which is transforming students at God's pace at God's timing, with great love and care, how would we do that through something we already know and, and brings us joy? Got four minutes. Is there one more question, Jill, or something that you, you find compelling? What do you? Yeah, I think, no, this is, I mean, this is all super compelling and I almost kind of want to end there, but I also want to uh, eke out as much time from this as we can. So, you know, one one other question, any particular resources on social entrepreneurship or any, uh, you mentioned a few really good books about um, youth and trauma and all of that. Is there anything that, that has really grounded you in this work and given you some good tools for someone I, just starting out in this? I would I would uh, go read, you may not love all of it. I don't necessarily agree with all of it myself. The Toxic Charity, it's a small little book by Bob Lupton. It gets into the concept of asset-based community development, which starts with the idea that we are not gonna enter into any work and service we do from the place of pitying those that we serve. 
but rather going to look for their strengths and assets and say, God wants to build off of those. Um, and in doing that, we will preserve more of their dignity. We will not take their dignity away as we go about this work. That was a very shaping book for me. Um, uh, let's see. You can, you know what? Just Google. Here's what I Google. This is what I do. I just go on and I Google what are the top 10 books on social enterprise? And then I go read two of them or innovation or anything else. And I like to learn. I believe that the heart of innovation is learning from the best and the brightest, no matter where they are. And then my job as theologian is to figure out how to interpret that good work in a way that al either aligns or slightly differently because of what the gospel is that says, well, no, we're not going to do it that way, but that part is true. And if you can start to do that, do theological reflection in that way, then you can borrow from anywhere. So I just go look for the best resources. Um, and often I find those outside the church, to be frank. <laughs> so th that's what I do. And there's not a lot. There, there are some good books starting to emerge around Christian social enterprise or redemptive entrepreneurship or missional enterprise that you can find. But I will tell you, a lot of those folks haven't actually done it on the ground. That's usually frustrates me the most. They've read books. They've gotten a grant from somewhere. But so I go find somebody who's actually done it. And I wrote a so, book. You can read that if you want it. It's short. It's practical. It's just called Mentorship and Marketplace, A New Direction for Youth Ministry. And it'll tell you more of the story in detail and how you might go about it and preliminary ideas to get started. That's awesome, Matt. Thank you so much for being here, for giving us umpteen ideas and resources. We're so grateful for that. Uh, folks, feel free to join us again next month. Uh, and before then, feel free to join us for the, the clips that we will gather from interviewing that subsequently. But please do mark your calendars for Wednesday, April 7th, where we will welcome the Reverend Piwa Longani to speak to us about space making and LGBTQ plus youth ministry in particular. Uh, but Matt, thank you so much for being here. We're so glad yeah. to have had you. Thank you guys for having me. It's great to see all of you and just get to engage. Thanks for letting me share. I love it. Thanks, folks. Take care. Have a good day. Yeah.